Hello and welcome to our next topic of discussion. Today we will be talking about meiosis. So in our previous lecture, we had discussed a type of cellular division called mitosis. Mitosis was what's referred to as an asexual division. All we were doing was taking one cell, making an identical copy of it, so that we would have two identical cells. This was an important feature of uh, a variety of tissues in, in our bodies in order to replace cells that become damaged or to replace cells um, that uh, essentially just can't divide anymore. Mitosis is an important uh, critical feature for maintaining processes in living things. So what's meiosis? Meiosis is a little bit different. This is also a type of cell division, but this particular type of cell division has a completely different purpose than mitosis does. So we're going to talk about what meiosis is, we'll compare meiosis and mitosis, and we'll talk a little bit about how sperm and egg cells are formed. So this is another form of cell division, but this is a specialized form of cell division, and it only occurs within the sex cells of living things. So this is uh, not a process that you would find uh, anywhere uh, in the body except for those specific, again, gonads or sex organ. So when we're talking about uh, humans, for example, uh, or other mammals in particular, the male gonads are the testes and the female gonads are the ovaries. So that's where this very specific process is occurring. The whole purpose of meiosis is to produce sex cells. We often refer to these as gametes. In a male, these gametes are referred to as sperm. In a female, these gametes are referred to as eggs. Here's some interesting things about sex cells, these gametes. Uh, these cells have half the genetic information that a regular somatic cell has. Somatic cell is all of the other cells in your body except your sex cells. So during our mitosis lecture, we were talking about how a normal heart or skin or liver cell would go through that process of mitosis. Um, those are all somatic cells. Egg and sperm are the only types of sex cells that we have, and so therefore they are specialized in that we are reducing the number of chromosomes by one half. We don't want a full complement of chromosomes. We only want half as many chromosomes as there are in those other cells. And why is this? Well, because in the process of sexual reproduction, we have a male and female gamete that fuse together and they create a complete set, which is 46 chromosomes in total. So we wouldn't want uh, 46 and 46 coming together, that would be way too many chromosomes. Instead, we just want 23 and 23, and that makes a perfect number of 46. So let's talk about meiosis and chromosomes. How do we know which 23 chromosomes are going to end up in a gamete? Remember, you have 46 chromosomes total in your cells, and our goal is to get one copy of each of those uh, into uh, a different gamete. So we look to get one of each kind. So your chromosomes are numbered, basically uh, the pairs are numbered from one to 23. And we want one of each of the pairs to end up in the cells we're going to create in meiosis. Okay, so chromosomes come in pair. Each somatic cell has two of every chromosome. And we refer to that pair as a homologous pair of chromosomes. So let's talk about homologous chromosomes for a moment. A homologous pair of chromosomes carry the exact same genes. So when we're looking at this particular diagram, we can talk about uh, genes A, B, and C. We're just gonna call them very simply genes A, B, and C. Uh, on a homologous pair of chromosomes, one of these came from your mom, one of these came from your dad, and this is what you have in every somatic cell in your body. These are the pairs that we want to split up. When we're going through meiosis, we wanna make sure that one of these chromosomes ends up in one of the cells, and one of these chromosomes ends up in the other cell. This is a non-homologous pair. They have different genes. So this particular chromosome has A, B, and C. This chromosome has H, I, J, K, and L. So these are non-homologous, right? We are looking to take homologous pairs of chromosomes and separate them through the process of meiosis. 
So what we're going to do, remember the purpose of mitosis was to separate sister chromatids. The purpose of meiosis is to separate homologous pairs of chromosomes. So that's what our goal here is. When we do that, we will create cells that are referred to as haploid. Haploid is similar to half, right? We have half the amount of genetic information that we're supposed to have, which is good in a gamete. So again, we're creating through the process of meiosis haploid cells. So what happens then is we create these um, gametes in the process of meiosis, also referred to as sex cells. It occurs in the testes or, testes or ovaries for humans. Once those two come together, they will produce a zygote or fertilized egg. And that fertilized egg will then have the exact number of chromosomes it's supposed to, two of each kind. And we refer to that as a diploid cell. So diploid has two of each kind of chromosome. So again, as a review, all of the somatic cells in your body are diploid and all of the gamete cells in your body are haploid. So just like we saw in mitosis, meiosis is preceded by an interphase, two gap phases and a synthesis phase uh, followed by our division. Okay. So cell division in this case is not mitosis, it's meiosis. And meiosis consists of phases. The good news is you've heard of these phases before. The only difference is we're going to go through the whole process twice. So there's a meiosis one and a meiosis two. So in meiosis one, we have the uh, homologous pairs separate. In meiosis two, we take the sister chromatids and separate them. So that means there are two divisions in meiosis. So rather than ending up with just two daughter cells, we're going to end up with four daughter cells. So here's our meiosis diagram. Okay, so we're looking at interphase. We replicate all the chromosomes. We go through the process of meiosis one and then meiosis two. So meiosis one is pulling apart homologous pairs of chromosomes. Meiosis two is pulling apart sister chromatids. So when we are finished, we have four daughter cells that have half the amount of genetic information that we started with. So we started with four chromosomes. All of our daughter cells now have two chromosomes. So let's talk through these. Uh, just like we saw in mitosis, meiosis has phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So the good news is, is this is, should sound very familiar to you. The other part of this, which uh, should sound familiar, is uh, what happens at each of these steps. The only difference is in meiosis one, we're talking about homologous pairs versus sister chromatids. So the homologous pairs come together in prophase one. The homologous pairs line up at the equator in metaphase one. The pairs separate from each other in anaphase one, and then we have a nuclear envelope that reforms in telophase one. So again, here's the process where we're once again in prophase. We actually begin to see the chromosomes. They become invisible. They condense. So this is prophase sort of late and early, just so you can kind of see the difference. The nuclear envelope is going to disintegrate. We have the centrioles at the poles creating the microtubules. Um, I'm sorry, the centrioles at the poles creating the spindle fibers. The spindle fibers attach in metaphase. We're moving these into the center. The homologous pairs separate in anaphase. And then we have, again, two uh, distinct groupings of genetic material here in telophase, right? So again, very, very similar to what you've seen in mitosis. The only difference is, is we're talking about homologous pairs of chromosomes now instead of sister chromatids. So again, here are the steps, as I mentioned. In meiosis two, we have, guess what? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase again. Meiosis two, for all intents and purposes, is identical to mitosis. It's identical, right? We're gonna be talking about sister chromatids again. So mitosis, my, excuse me, meiosis two is just like we saw before, but now we're starting with, again, these um, two cells, that were the result of meiosis one. We have halved the amount of genetic information already. So these are haploid cells, 
but these haploid cells have replicated chromosomes to them. We still need to get these away from each other. So we go through the process of mitosis, excuse me, meiosis too. See, I almost said mitosis because it's that similar. Um, but the sister chromatids line up at the equator. In anaphase, they are pulled apart. In telophase, we have nuclear envelopes that reform. And then through cytokinesis, we'll pinch these all off. What we have are four haploid daughter cells. And rather than those daughter cells being identical to each other, which at mitosis, we had two identical cells, every single one of these daughter cells are different. And we're going to talk about the processes that ensure that they are different from each other. So again, here's just a summary of metaphase, anaphase, and telophase 2. So for all intents and purposes, meiosis 2 is just like mitosis. However, here's something important. When we are creating sex cells, these gametes, these eggs, and these sperms, we do not want identical copies. Um, the whole goal of sexual reproduction is to create new genetic combinations, genetic combinations that have never been seen before. That ensures what we refer to as genetic variation. So genetic variation is important because as a species, you don't want clones, right? You don't want exact identical copies of living things running around out there. Because what if that particular individual or plant or bird or whatever it happens to be, what if it's susceptible to a disease? If everyone had that exact same copy of that genetic information and you're susceptible to a disease, then your entire species could be wiped out. So what's important is that as living things are reproducing, as we're going through this process of sexual reproduction, the whole point is to create brand new novel combinations of genetics that will hopefully enable each species to survive in a changing environment. That's the whole goal. So when it all comes back to production of these gametes, because we want every single offspring that's created to be genetically different. So that's why siblings from the same parents, they'll look similar, but they'll always be genetically distinct with the exception of identical twins, right? So identical twins are a case um, where essentially you have a single gamete uh, that very early on in the um, process of um, fertilization and, and as we have that gamete growing and the cells dividing, there's a a point at which that gamete divides into two and so all of the genetic information would be identical but that's that's rare for the most part we're talking about producing new and novel combinations so that every new offspring born from parents is different so it results in again genetic what we call recombination and also variability and variability is good in species because we want to have novel uh, combinations of traits so that as things change as new viruses um, emerge, as new conditions on the planet emerge, it gives our species a better chance at survival. So how do we create genetic recombination? How do we ensure that every single gamete is different? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can go through something called crossing over. So during prophase one, the homologous pairs of chromosomes, the ones that have the identical uh cop the identical uh, genes on them right so the same genes gene a b c d e and f in this case here's what we do we're going to take this homologous pair of chromosomes and we're going to swap a little bit of genetic information okay so they're going to hug each other so the chromosomes kind of hug they create something called a chiasma and when they do that a little piece of the blue chromosome breaks off and switches places with a little bit of the green chromosome creates a brand new two brand new chromosomes right so this chromosome here and this chromosome here are new right that genetic combination hasn't occurred yet this is a whole new shakeup of this genetic information that's novel that's new the other thing uh, that our cells do to ensure we have uh, more genetic variability is something called independent assortment. So independent assortment basically says that chromosomes are inherited independently of each other. So let's take a look at a blue and a green chromosome. We have a big blue and a little blue and a big green and a little green. 
as we're dividing these up and we're lining up on the equator uh, during metaphase one of meiosis, we line up in an independent assortment. It simply means that uh, the blue, the big blue chromosome is equally as likely to travel with the little blue chromosome as it is to travel with uh, the green uh, or the little green or the big green chromosome, okay? So the idea here is simple, is that we don't have any preferred pattern of how chromosomes, uh, homologous chromosomes are separating. It's completely random. Uh, so we could have, uh, again, 16 blues, uh, and then we would have seven greens that get inherited or any combination thereof. When I'm saying greens and blues, I mean, assume blue is the paternal copy and, and uh, green is the maternal copy. Again, the idea here is that there's no particular way that these things will sort. So they will sort any way they want. It's independent assortment, which means we create all kinds of new genetic combinations along with uh, the crossing over process I just talked about. So this is a really great comparison of mitosis and meiosis. I highly, highly, highly encourage you uh, to look at this information and really commit it to heart uh, because this is a really nice synthesis of exactly what's going on. So the number of divisions, uh, how many cells are created, whether they're identical, whether they're different, where it occurs, when it occurs, and what the purpose of mitosis is versus the purpose of meiosis. So very important information there. Um, and then just really quickly, I want to leave you with a couple of diagrams here at the end that sort of show you how this process occurs in males versus females. So this is spermatogenesis. This is sperm formation. And basically, you sp start with something called a spermatogonium. This is the, the diploid parent cell. Uh, and this diploid parent cell is the one then that will go through um, a, a mitotic phase first, uh, which will then again create autosomes and sex chromosomes. And then what you'll have is sort of this division of these secondary spermatocytes, which it creates. And then the secondary spermatocytes go through meiosis one and meiosis two, and they create all of these genetically haploid sperm cells. And again, in, in men, this process um, starts as soon as sexual maturity hits, and the process lasts uh, essentially until um, death for men, right? They will continue to create sperm. Process looks a little bit different in females. In females, you have oogenesis. This is egg production. So you have the oogonium, which once again divides to create this primary oocyte. The primary oocyte then again goes through meiosis one and meiosis two. Um, but what's interesting about this is that we have um, one egg that's basically created and, and several what are referred to as polar bodies. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, females don't create nearly uh, as many sex cells as males do. Uh, essentially, a female is born with all of the egg cells she's ever going to have. Um, and if uh, fertilization occurs, that egg cell then will go through maturity, become a mature egg, and then go on um, to create a zygote. Again, this is just a nice comparison of oogenesis versus spermatogenesis. So, you know, when it happens and how long it happens, and it's just kind of a nice summary of the two processes, just so that you can see the difference. So in today's lecture, uh, we talked about some new things and some things that were familiar to you. You should know what a gamete is. You should know the difference between haploid and diploid, and you should know about crossing over. You should also know these important concepts and be uh, prepared to represent those on our next exam.